Alrighty, well, since it's seven o'clock and we're in it for the long haul tonight for two hours, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, tonight, we're going to be having Dr. Christian Krepke talk on seed coding for us. And then after that, Mark Kepler, who is the Ag Educator in Fulton County, is going to do our regulatory topic. So, Christian, if you'd like to go ahead, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen in a second here, but before I do that, um, I just like to encourage all of you that if you have uh, questions, uh, feel free to uh, to put them into the chat. Um, I'll address them at the end. I won't I won't uh, look at them during my talk. And and of course, if you want to ask your question uh, via Zoom, I'd be happy to handle that too. Okay. I'm going to share my screen with you here. All right, here we go. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um, focus on research both from uh, Purdue over the last several years and from other areas on this question of the pros and cons of what I, what I call insurance pest management. And I'll talk a little more later about what that means. But um, in a nutshell, uh, you know, to start off, I'd like to just uh, define it by saying, when we use seed treatments of, of corn or soybeans, we're assuming that we're gonna get some pests coming in. When we use BT corn, we're assuming that we're corn borers coming in or corn root. What I'm gonna do is focus on the seed treatment side of things and address some of the research that we found that reflects where they work, when they work, and when they don't. Uh, what are the pros and cons from the points of view of both yield and, and other uh, aspects of whether these work? All right, now I'm gonna talk about both corn and soybeans. As we know, uh, this is some, some, uh, a couple of maps of corn and soybean production in the US. They're largely overlapping as, as all of us know. So the reason I, remind everybody is of this is to let you know that if we're using something like let's say neonicotinoid seed treatments so this is a, an insecticide that we put on seeds that we then plant in the soil and that insecticide then is on the seeds is in the soil and protecting the crop so when we talk just about corn or just about soybeans we're kind of missing a bit of the picture in that every year we're putting insecticide in that field so if there are pests there in a corn year or a soybean year, they're gonna find an equally, generally an equally rough uh, environment in terms of uh, trying to access that seed. So we have typically almost all corn and the majority of soybeans are treated. So we do have a lot of um, insecticide that goes out every year and we have a lot of protection on those two crops. <clears throat> now neonicotinoids have relatively rapidly become become the number one insecticide class worldwide. And most of that, most of the reason for that is uh, seed treatments of corn, soybeans, cotton, a few other crops, but corn and soybeans are the big two. Um, they're effective against many insects. Uh, they're, so they're what we call a broad spectrum insecticide. They're not selective. Uh, as I said, virtually all corn and most soybeans are treated. Um, the insects that are most susceptible are the xylem feeder. Xylem is what the plant tissue that's like um, uh, a, a hollow straw that conducts water up the plant. So that's sap feeders will feed on the xylem of plants and that's things like aphids. Um, it's a non-specific mode of action as I said and that's why we get these concerns about honeybees and you've probably heard a little bit about honeybees and and neonicotinoids and that's because neonicotinoids are extremely toxic to honeybees. All insecticides are uh, to some degree. Neonicotinoids are even more toxic than some of our older chemistries. And so that just means when we plant these, we have to be very careful. We have, to, we have a smaller margin of error when you're using something more toxic than when you're using something less toxic, of course. So the reasons that we adopted these, the reasons the EPA approved them and they're so widely used are the low vertebrate toxicity. So any organism with a backbone like us and fish and dogs and cats and so on. And they're very highly water soluble. So that means, and I'll talk more about this later, that they dissolve very well in water. And that's why you get them moving up into a plant. 
Uh, if it didn't dissolve well in water, like pyrethroids, some of our older insecticides, they don't move up into the plant. They stay where you put them. If you remember your old force and Aztec granulars that you used to use for corn rootworms, that stuff doesn't move. It stays where you put it. At planting time, there's a, there's a granular insecticide. You lay the seed on top of that. That granular insecticide is a barrier against insects. It's toxic to insects, but it does not enter the plant. So that's a big difference with neonicotinoids. Now, this is a slide from the USDA, and it shows on the bottom axis, you see 1995 to 2010. And you see we're using a lot less insecticide, and pounds per planted acre is on the vertical axis there, right? We go from zero to 0.3. And you can see in 1995, we're using about 0.21 pounds per planted acre, but now, or in 2010 rather, that's, this is the most recent data they have on this we're using about 0 0.01, so a huge decline. Um, and, but this slide is not, does not tell the whole story. It's not a very useful slide, I would say. And a, a USDA person came and presented this data to our, our department a few years ago, and that's where I got the idea for a slide. Because when you think about insecticides, what's the most important thing you want to know about that in terms of how well it works? You want to know how many insects can you kill with it? You don't wanna know how much it weighs. That's not too terribly important. Um, so when you look at killing power or toxicity, and if you look at the figure on the left, this is out of a, a paper that I have referenced seven out of that paper. And it shows the acute toxicity to honeybees, and you could choose any insect, but it's, honeybees are the ones we have a lot of data for. And you go from 1992 to now, and you see how much more toxic our insecticides now are. So our insecticides are way, way better at killing insects. And if you look on the graph on the right, you see corn and soybeans account for most of that use. So the, the point of this slide is to show you two things. Number one, we're using more insecticide when you measure it by toxicity than we used to. And number two, most of that is in corn and soybeans. And, and most of that is through neonicotinoids in corn and soybeans. And when you think about neonicotinoids, I want you to think of them in terms of the big two, which are thiamethoxin and clothianidin. Thiamethoxin is often called cruiser. Uh, clothianidin is called um, poncho often. Uh, Escalate is, is also a, a trade name that's out there. There are probably others. But those are the main two we're gonna talk about. So one of the things that we did a few years ago was working in honeybees when we had a call come in uh, to my office and said, you know, we've got some dead bees at the apiary, you know, and a neighbor's planting corn. What's going on? I said, well, nothing to do with the corn because if we're planting corn, we're not putting any insecticide on at the time. There's no pests yet in the field. So anyway, we did look closer and we looked at the bees out in that field. And what we found is those bees that were dead were intersecting um, corn planting operations. And if you look at this graph here, oops. Well, first let me explain one thing about bees that's interesting. They get charged up as they're flying through the air. So similar to if you shuffle across a carpet, build up a static charge, and then you touch somebody and you give them a zap. Bees, as they're flying through the air, they build up friction. And that friction that they build up can be very useful when they then go to a plant and they wanna collect pollen. So bees eat two things, pollen and nectar, both of them from plants. Pollen is the, the fat and the protein source. Nectar is the sugar source. And they, they eventually make that into honey, of course. So if you're a bee, it's good if you're charged in flight because it makes it that much easier to collect pollen, as you see on that bee in the bottom right. But if you're flying through the air and there's something in the air that might be toxic, as you see, usually happens, this blue line represents when bees are flying, the orange box or the green box represents when corn is planted. You can see a lot of overlap there. So if you're a bee in Indiana and you're flying around in mid-April and into early May looking for flowers, you're gonna cross a cornfield. And that's where our research started on this topic. And what we found, and, and I've presented this before, so I'm not gonna say too much about it, is that when we plant treated seeds, we have to use talc or graphite or those seeds stick to each other and you get a lot of doubles or skips. 
If you don't plant with a lubricant like talc or graphite, you generally have problems and we've tried it and it's not, it's not good. You need that lubricant in there. So what we did was we tested that exhaust material from these pneumatic planters or air planters. And what we found was that in many cases, excuse me here, got jammed up, was in many cases that that talc, that material would move beyond the planted field. And here's a schematic of what we did. You can see the planter there on the left. We can see this is the dust cloud. And you know you don't want to put bees right beside corn for many reasons, uh, including that this, this, uh, this uh, talc and graphite exhaust and neonicotinoids. But what we wanted to know is how far can we put bees away from corn planting and, and be safe? Many people that I know uh, that are beekeepers are also farmers or live next door to farmers. They wanted to know how far away is far away enough. And that's the question that we were asking. And the way we did that is we took all the hive locations in Indiana and they're all marked in a site called Driftwatch, which you may know about. We took the crop type data, which is in the USDA database in corn or soybeans or what have you, other land cover like streams and, and, uh, and bodies of water and so on, and the wind velocity. And we basically took all of these data and put them together and we assessed how far that corn dust moved, that, that dust from corn planting. How far does that move beyond the planted field? And then we put in the, the parameter of how far bees move across the landscape. This in Indiana, the red dots. And you can see that around Indianapolis, um, up by uh, Fort Wayne and Gary and in the Hoosier National Forest are about the only large areas um, without a lot of corn. And that's not too surprising. These blue dots here is a 1.4 kilometer, just under a mile foraging radius around each colony. That's a, about how far worker bees will go. And so what we wanted to know is where's a safe place for bees? If you assume that this corn planting carries neonicotinoid dust that kills bees, how far should we go? Um, and we ignored the static charge thing. So we just said, okay, if dust lands on bees, you may kill these bees. And we assumed no drift beyond 100 meters. That's how far we sampled uh, beyond, so about 300 feet uh, beside the planted field. And what we found here is that when people ask me, how far, where should I move my bees? Uh, the answer is that there's no place really to move them. So 94% of Indiana honeybees will encounter some of that dust. Um, and some of those encounters will be lethal. And that's why we were seeing those dead bees at planting time. That was the intersection between a seed treatment that goes on your corn seed and the seed gets planted in the ground. That's how that stuff was getting on bees. They were flying in or near or behind planters and they were getting that talc and that dust on them. Only one and a half percent of Indian apiaries were outside the deposition zone. So what I tell people, instead of moving your bees, there are two things you can do. Uh, one of them, because you don't want to move your bees out of state. You're not going to move them to Montana or somewhere out of the Midwest. That doesn't make any sense. So there are a couple of things you can do instead. One of them is keep the bees in the colony all day by using um, hardware cloth or window screens stuffed into the opening. Keep them in there for the day of planting, if your neighbor or you are planting. The other one is to just, if you have just a couple of, of uh, colonies, leave a lawn sprinkler on the bees. So set it so it doesn't move and stays on the bees. They'll think it's raining and they'll stay in all day. They'll be very grouchy at the end of the day. So turn off that sprinkler at night uh, because they do get grouchy when they don't get to forage because they get hungry and thirsty and all that sort of thing. We get grouchy under those conditions too. Um, and, but then you will at least keep the bees in. But in terms of moving bees somewhere else, there really isn't a solution for that problem. So that was one dimension of neonicotinoid seed treatments that was kind of unexpected and, and counterintuitive because when we first started studying these, we thought, what a great idea. You put insecticide on the seed, it moves into the plant. If an insect doesn't mess with the plant, everything's fine. Right? This isn't like he's a sprayer going across the field that um, applies a liquid insecticide or, or a uh, crop duster plane. Um, this is quite different. This is quite targeted, we thought. But, you know, this was something that was unanticipated. So we got at that question. 
Um, unfortunately, since then, we still have this issue. We're still using talc and graphite. We still have B kills. Uh, this, is a, this is a shot from uh, earlier this year. So the, the problem hasn't gone away, unfortunately. I know there are some groups and some industry groups working on um, approaches that have less dust drift, but currently talc and graphite is it. Uh, so that's why I highlight this uh, as potential solutions, keeping the bees in the colony for the day uh, or two around planting time. So let's talk about what happens to the neonicotinoid that doesn't get scraped off and doesn't, doesn't go into, out into the air. How much of it enters the plant? So this is a corn seed that's treated with neonicotinoid. I just made it purple. It can come in many colors, as you know, pink, green being common. We estimate we lose two or 3% of it as dust during planting. What we wanted to know next is how much goes into the plant. That's where we want it to be. We want this material in our corn and in our soybeans to ward off pests early in the season. And what we did here is we looked at, at, at uh, one of the locations near campus, we looked at corn seedlings and we measured the concentrations of insecticide in those leaves and in those roots through the early season. Okay, and we had a, a DeKalb hybrid, we did this a few years ago, with naked seed, with fungicide only, and I have an asterisk beside both of those because you really can't get those as a, as a commercial corn grower in Indiana. That's not really available. Then we have a low rate of poncho or crylothianidin and the higher rate. I'm only going to show you the data from the higher rate because um, the, rate, the low rate data are very low. And what we did is through the season, every three days, collected the plants, collected a subsample of the plants, and collected some of the root, the shoot, and the seed. We then ground that up in a very expensive blender in the lab, homogenized it, and we measured the neonicotinoid content every three days through the entire season. And here's what we found, and, and you can see the shoot, root, and seed going top to bottom along the uh, vertical axis. You have the amount of clothianidin, micrograms per gram of plant tissue, and you can see right away that we approach zero. Um, the the x-axis along the bottom is days post planting. That's what DPP stands for. Uh, and you can see that by the time we get to about two weeks out, we don't have that material in the plant anymore. So the decay curve, the release curve, looks kind of like this. There's a, a rapid early peak, and it drops off very rapidly. Okay, so the amount of protection you get from pest infestations is probably a couple of weeks or so, not much beyond that. So that's different than what we thought it would be. We thought it would be a longer window of pest management of pest, potential pest control, but it isn't. And why is that? Well, it's time for, for a little bit of chemistry of neonicotinoids, and the answer comes down to the chemistry of the compound, water solubility specifically. So this little diagram, this little schematic shows a low, a moderate, and a high water solubility uh, pesticide. I'll give you examples of each. The low is warrior. It's a pyrethroid insecticide you're probably all familiar with. You can only dissolve about 0 0.005 milligrams in a liter of water. That's a tiny little granule on the tip of your finger that you can hardly see. Only one of those, one little granule, 1.005 milligram. Uh, quantity will go into a liter of water before it starts settling out, as you see there. Something that would be a moderate example would be atrazine. It's about 10 times more soluble, so you can get 0 0.03 milligrams per liter into water there. Now, what about neonicotinoids? I told you they're highly water soluble. Look at these differences 270 for clothianidin, 4,100 for thiamethoxin. So what that tells you is this material dissolves very readily in water, like, like sugar or salt might. Um, that's, those are soluble compounds that we, we're all familiar with. And that if you have water around a seed, and that seed is then charging up that plant, any excess material will, go, will not stay there. It will go into the water. Okay, so something that's highly water soluble is hard to keep in one place because it always wants to go into solution, always wants to go where 
there's a, if it rains, of course, that uh, water falling down from the sky has no neonicotinoid in it. A lot of the neonicotinoid will go into that water. If the plant is saturated at that moment, there's nowhere else for it to go. It'll leave the, the area, leave the seed, leave the, leave the region where the root is growing. So this explains that quick uptake and the short time in plant tissues. We'd like a compound that stays on the seed and just meters out all year and gives us a nice, steady, constant protection window. But that's not how, how chemistry works. We, we can't have it that way. So what we found is when you add all that up, only about one or two percent of what you put on the seed ever gets into the plant. And that's because it's so water soluble. So now you're wondering, where does the 90% go? Where does the rest go? And that's what we spent some time trying to figure out. This is an aerial shot of the water quality field station uh, near campus at Purdue. Each of those uh, rectangles is a planting, a plot of uh, corn or soybeans, depending on the year. And each of those plots is surrounded by a clay box. And so they're all discrete in terms of their uh, water that runs through them. So if you look at those from above, imagine rain falling on them. That rain that hits and that water that hits that plot stays in that plot. It doesn't go to any adjacent plots. It doesn't leave that area. This is a schematic showing what I'm talking about. And you can see we're tile drained here. We have the rain path, the rain falls, falls into this box. And then you can go down a short little flight of stairs down there and you can see the green here is, a, is uh, attached to uh, the red bucket uh, where if you have sufficient quantities of rainfall, it automatically tips and then you can come and collect your water samples. So this is just a way of assessing all the water that passes through the soil and the crop and collecting it. And what we're interested in, of course, is analyzing how much neonicotinoid is in it. Is it going into the tile drains? Is it going into the water? And the short answer to that question is yes. That's where uh, the majority of what we apply to seeds winds up. These dates here in June and July of uh, 2016 and 17 are the dates of the peak uh, clothianidin or poncho detection in rainwater. And that's interesting because we're talking about a period that is probably close to two months after planting, right? So it takes a while for it to move that far and for it to move away from the treated seed, move down through the soil, move with water into the tiles, but that is where it winds up. So this is starting to answer our question of where the rest of this material goes. One of the other things that other researchers have found is that since it's so water soluble, we find a lot of these neonicotinoids in honey. Now, neonicotinoids are not very toxic to vertebrates like us, but it's still interesting to know what we're eating, what's in the honey. So these researchers, this is a kind of a cool study where they collected honey from six continents. And what this Mitchell guy did, he sent all his lab members out and he said, when you go on vacation, when you go home for the holidays, when you go anywhere, buy some honey. Wherever you go, buy honey and bring it back and we'll analyze it. And what they're doing is looking just for neonicotinoids. They're just curious because we know these are really water soluble. We know honey is mostly water, uh, you know, very sweet, of course. So they're wondering, does this wind up in honey? Uh, and the short answer is yes, 75% of the samples contain at least one neonicotinoid, 45% of them contain two, and 10% contain four or five. So this is just more evidence that shows that these materials are very mobile and they move around. Now these authors didn't make any inferences or any, any fear mongering about, oh, this could kill you or anything like that, because that's not their area. They're just documenting and saying, you know, this stuff is water soluble and therefore it's very present in honey. And, uh, and bees are of course exposed to it in that way as well. So what we did in our lab a few years ago is we wanted to ask those similar questions except about pollen. As I told you a few minutes ago, bees eat honey or eat nectar and they eat pollen. So we uh, conducted a study in and around some corn plantings a few years ago. This slide here shows on the left what we call a pollen trap. This replaces the bottom board in a, uh, at a beehive and you can see there's a drawer that pulls out. And Bees can fly in here. They fly in at about the midpoint 
this is my pointer here. They fly in about the midpoint of this um, cedar and, and uh, mesh construction, and then they can go up through this mesh here. Those mesh holes are about a, a half an inch in diameter. So it scrapes off any honey or any pollen rather that these bees have collected. So we're robbing them of all their pollen as they enter the colony. Can't do this all season, the, the colony will starve, uh, but, or it'll, it'll suffer anyway. Uh, but we did it for most of the season and we collected all that pollen and you can see it, this is our lab here. You can see it all laid out. We sorted it by color at first. We had three sites where we did this, a natural area, a meadow of sorts, uh, near campus, an untreated cornfield, again, as near campus as we could get because we wanted to have a similar site and a treated cornfield. And I went every week and collected this pollen. And those bees were very, very surly and, and, and very um, uh, defensive and, and, and nasty. And it was an unpleasant time. Uh, but we got some good data, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, we collected that pollen. We extracted any pesticides out of that pollen and not just neonicotinoids. We looked at everything because we wanted to know what are these bees eating when they're living near corn. We know they're not just eating corn. Uh, it doesn't have pollen for very long. Um, so, we'll, so what are they eating? And then we, uh, we analyzed um, uh, for pesticides and we also we looked at what are the pollen species. Okay, uh, we identified all that pollen using microscopy and when we, we did a pesticide screen where we looked at insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. We looked at ag compounds, residential and homeowner compounds, everything. And we can go down here, LOD is limit of detection, 0 0.01 parts per billion. So all that, the reason I put that on there is to show you that this is a very, very sensitive assay. So if pesticides are there, we're going to find them. It doesn't mean it's bad for bees or people or anything like that necessarily, although some of the levels were uh, bad for bees, but it's just showing you that this is a very sensitive way of looking for pesticides. Okay, this is one slide I wanted to show you, just looking at the diversity of what the bees feed on. You can see we're going from May through September here. All these different colors and, and, uh, and dia or, uh, shading schemes represent different plants. And you can see all the names of all the plants on the right side. I just want to highlight a couple of things. This light purple here and this uh, yellow, those are clovers. Clovers formed a large part of what, of what these bees foraged upon. This here is a weed called plantain, which most of you will know. Right here we have corn, see a maize, which is uh, green with the, with the dots in it. So the point of this slide is just to show you that bees, beside a treated cornfield, so this is a cornfield that's grown from neonicotinoid treated seed, they find a wide, wide range of, of plants to feed on. It's really amazing and quite interesting actually uh, to see that, you know, they find stuff out there. They go to homeowners, you know, gardens and so forth, find all kinds of things to forage upon. But our next question was to ask what pesticides are there? And that's what this slide is showing. And on the vertical here, we have mean concentrations in the pollen parts per billion. And you can see this is just a total. We go from zero to up to over 1400, okay? That's the first thing to notice. You'll right away see that this purple over here is a large peak at the end of the season, and this gray is a peak as well. Neither of those insecticides are agricultural. Neither of them are even available for corn growers to use. They're called phenothrin, the purple, and prolethrin, the, the gray. And those are primarily used by homeowners, by municipalities for mosquito control. So this purple here was a mosquito abatement type of deal in all likelihood, and, and this as well. So even though we're right beside agriculture, we're picking up a really large peak here of a mosquito type of control. So what we did after we got this result is we called that area and we said, you know, was there a mosquito abatement in that area at that time? Oh yeah, there was. Oh, okay. Can you give us the details? What were the compounds? What were the dates? Oh, we'll call you back. No, never, never heard back again that the line went cold and eventually, and we kept trying and asking and we didn't ever get an answer. So I'm not sure exactly you know, what went on there, or why we didn't get our answer. 
Um, but I think the take home message here is that even right beside agriculture, it's not as agriculture that tells the story. Now, having said that, our third most lethal insecticide was clothianidin, which is poncho. And again, we don't have corn flowering here. We don't have any agricultural plants flowering yet. But around 20th of June, we get a peak of clothianidin in that pollen. So what's that, what is that telling you? That's telling you that that water from corn, the cornfield, which has clothianidin in it, is likely being taken up by other plants, weeds, clovers, whatever, and then being collected by bees. So when we ranked all of our insecticides by toxicity, number one was the purple, phenothrin, number two was the uh, prolethrin, and number three was this little clothianidin peak because it's so much more toxic. So even being just this one tiny peak, it was on the same order of magnitude as these other two pyrethroids. So two lessons there. Number one is the material moves and moves into uh, some counterintuitive, uh, uh, some counterintuitive areas like pollen of non-crop plants. And number two, because neonicotinoids are more toxic, the bees don't need to ingest as much of them. Okay, so we've talked a lot about you know, bees and pollen and nectar and all these sorts of things. Let's talk about the benefits of these for farming. So we know these seed treatments are labeled for lots of pests. This is just a few, uh, just a subsection of them that are listed here. There are many more. These are probably the ones that are of most interest to Indiana producers, Midwestern producers. Seven years ago, it's getting old now. I would love to repeat this. I had difficulty getting the seed to do so. Looking at naked seed, poncho 250 and poncho 1250, uh, both of those with fungicide. And what we're doing here is we're asking if we plant these seeds in, over these three years in these three sites, and these are our, our buggiest sites, our most insect prone uh, sites in terms of damage in the state that we have control over at Purdue. We wanted to look at the stand counts, the plant heights, root injury, and yield. I'm just going to talk about yield, and I'm going to tell you that um, that's the most interesting data. And um, in terms of the other parameters, we didn't see significant differences. So let's do, look at the yield between naked seed and the low and the high rate of poncho. This is 2012. You'll remember it was a drought year, especially at the, the more southern sites, which are our TPAC and DPAC, and then at Penny, we had a little bit better performance, but no statistical differences here in our yields uh, at any of the sites between naked, poncho 250, and 1250. No differences in 2013 either. No differences in 2014. So what's going on here? This, does this stuff not work? Um, I think there are a couple things going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that back a bit and, and go into more detail on that in a moment because I have some more data to show you on that point. But first I wanna show you some soybean aphid data. You recall I mentioned that many of our soybeans are treated with clothi or with thiamethoxam, Cruiser, or Cruiser Max is usually the most common um, seed treatment used. Soybean aphids are one of our most common pests that we have uh, for soybeans. In Indiana, if you made a list of soybean pests, that'd probably be number one for most of us. What we wanted to know is that same question as for corn, what's the pest killing window? If you plant a seed that's treated with cruiser, how long are you killing soybean aphids? How long are you protecting that soybean seedling? So again, we're looking at the intersection between insecticide in the plant, soybean aphid that want to feed on the plant. We want that intersection to be high. We want soybean aphids coming in when there's insecticide there so that they die. We don't have to count them later. We don't have to spray them later. Let's see what happens. All right, here you see our stage of the plant. VE is when the plant just emerges. VC is the cotyledons above ground. V1 is one unifoliate and so on. And then you have your days post planting going from eight to 18 so far. And what I'm showing you here is the parts per billion of cruiser in the untreated and the treated plant. Thiamethoxum is cruiser. And you can see early in the season, it's sky high, especially in the cotyledons, which of course is part of the seed, no surprise there. And then it drops off relatively quickly just a few days later. 
that's what that plant looked like at V2. So it has got two trifoliates on it. You can see, see there. After that, from 20 days onward, we have no significant statistical differences. So those numbers are not statistically different from one another. So from that point on, a soybean is a soybean is a soybean. There's no benefit to having the cruiser seed treatment on there. Most of the time, if we do get soybean aphids, we get them at R2 or R3 in August most of the time. So for most, and we're not even on the chart here, most of the growing season, you don't have uh, any insecticide in the tissue. So what this reflects is that seed treatments have a very poor overlap with soybean aphid in terms of timing. You're not likely to get your money back on those. And this diagram shows that same thing in a different way. You can see our neonicotinoid concentrations very high at the beginning of the year, the red triangle taper off by the time we get into V2, V3. Aphids show up maybe in the late V stages, but really peak as we get into R2, R3. And that's what's shown here. And you can see we just don't have a lot of overlap between those two dimensions. We don't have a lot of uh, synchrony between those. We'd like to have that for pest management. We don't have it. And again, it's because of the reasons I, I showed earlier of the, the, the um, water solubility of these compounds. They just don't hang around on the seed very long. Last year, uh, a study out, it led out of University of Wisconsin, Madison, a fellow named Sean Conley, who's a soybean agronomist there. He, uh, and I worked with him and, and others, there were about 20 of us, that aggregated all our field experiments from 2006 to 2017, all across the region. So we had over 11,000 yields. And we're trying to, again, ask the question, out of those 11,000 plots and those 11,000 yields, how often do we get a yield response in our cruiser treated soybeans? Okay, and this is, there, we have our three treatments, fungicide only, which is pretty common in soybeans, fungicide plus insecticide, the NST is, stands for neonicotinoid seed treatment, and our untreated controls or UTC in all locations. And what we did here is we looked in every trial at seeding rates of 100, 140, and 180,000 seeds per acre, Generally, most producers will be in the middle of that range. And then we looked at five soybean price scenarios from eight to 20 bushels per, or dollars per bushel. So of course, we're far from the high range of that now, currently. And what we wanted to do is say, okay, if soybeans get expensive enough, is it worth it to pay for the cruiser seed treatment? That's, that's one way of looking at it. And the reason we looked at it that way is because that pricing varies regionally. It varies with how the, your, your um, vendor, it varies with how much you buy and so on. But if you don't have a benefit, it doesn't matter how much it costs uh, because no benefit is no benefit. No, no yield advantage means no dollars. Okay, so that's the way we calculated it. Here's the paper here. You can find it online. It's open access. But this is really the, the main take home graph here. We have our untreated control and our yield here. We have fungicide plus neonicotinoid. We do have a little bit of a bump here, okay? It was about 1.3 or so bushels per acre. So if you equate that and you look at, okay, how much are we getting for soybeans? And you look at this middle set of graphs, that's 140,000 seeds per acre. And look at these yellow, um, symbols right here. That's our $8 per bushel estimate. Fungicide and fungicide plus insecticide. So you can see on fungicide only, we're right on zero. So we estimate zero benefit at 140,000 seeds per acre at an $8 bushel price. And we estimate a slight benefit with insecticide. Likely not enough for the, for the uh, approach to pay for itself but there is a slight benefit there. So what we're doing here is we're just trying to show that for the vast majority of producers, the vast majority of individuals, and that would be at the, at the hundred line shows all the individuals, you would not realize a benefit, okay? So you would have, what do we have here? Somewhere around eight or 9% of individuals would realize a slight positive benefit from this approach. If soybeans are worth more, that kind of goes up to 20%. If you have a higher seeding rate, it also goes up as well. 
Okay, there are some other recent studies on neonicotinoid-treated seeds. There was one out of New York State just last month. Uh, that was commissioned by the state. I'm not sure why they wanted that information, but this is available online. It's an open access report again. They looked at 908 trials, 89% of them had no yield benefit in corn from growing treated seeds. And they show that here. Here's New York only. They only, of course, have 14 trials. But if you look at all of North America, you can see we've got 908 trials and the vast majority of them, you don't see any advantage. A few of them have lower, some of them have higher yields. A couple other recent field studies. Uh, this one is from Quebec, Canada, came out this year as well. It was a five-year study in commercial fields, 84 sites. They had very few sites with pests, not a lot of insect pressure, no differences in yield um, throughout the study. A similar study in Ontario, Canada, uh, not too far from Indiana, a four-year study in this case, um, about 160 total sites, and you can see 8% of corn, 6% of soybeans showed a yield benefit. So this is, you're getting the trend here is that we have a hard time documenting yield benefits in the field. Now you may be asking, well, you're showing me these studies from Quebec and Ontario, and you showed me a little bit of Indiana data. Where's all the data from, you know, Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota? Where's the regional study from the United States? There aren't any. And the reason is that it's very difficult for me, for us as researchers, to get the access to the untreated seeds in the right hybrids and couple that with treated seeds to do the work. Uh, we're just not um, sold those seeds in sufficient quantities to do the work. And in my case, I've had a hard time getting any of it at all. For, for one reason or another, it seems to be unavailable to do these types of experiments. Uh, whereas in Canada, it was mandated that they had to have untreated seed available to growers that wanted it because they, have a, they just have more regulation there and they got really worked up about the bees a few years ago. So they said, you have to offer growers untreated seeds and all the hybrids. And so these researchers were able to do that work for that reason. You won't see similar work coming out of the U.S. because we can't get enough seed in the elite hybrids to do the work. Um, so this, this is what I have to offer you. So we talk a lot about IPM for insect management. Is this an integrated pest management approach? And you've heard of IPM before. This is a definition that I use in my class. And it emphasizes it's a comprehensive approach. Uses combined means to reduce the status of pests to tolerable levels while maintaining a quality environment. Okay, we can use that definition. You don't have to like that one. Uh, here's another longer one. I'm not going to read it. But the whole notion of IPM is that we don't use insecticides if we don't think we're going to get an economic benefit. Because we know from past history that using insecticides is not without risk to uh, other organisms. We all want to grow sufficient food. We all want to have our livelihood, but we all want a quality environment as well. Uh, nobody wants to, um, you know, pollute water and soil unnecessarily. So IPM was born out of that idea. So those are some definitions, and I would argue that if you treat all the corn seeds every year and we can't show benefits, that's not IPM because we're not gaining anything from it. Why are we doing this if it doesn't pencil out? Uh, but if you look online and you look at some of the IPM resources that are available, these are just a few on, from some of the largest manufacturers of, of seed and se sellers of seed. I've got Syngenta on here and, and, um, and Bayer, and uh, I think I have Bex as well. And they will, all of these little blurbs show that neonicotinoids are essential. They're the key to IPM solutions. So my point is it depends what your definition is and it depends how you define IPM. If you define it this way, we need neonicotinoids. It's necessary. Here's an interesting piece of data that I pulled out of a study. Where do IPM practitioners, that is you guys, you the audience, you guys that are doing it on your farm, where do you get your information? They did a phone survey of 500 growers in Minnesota, or maybe it was all of the US. It was, the study was, was based in Minnesota, University of Minnesota. And you can see crop consultant, seed or chemical company rep or ag retailer are the top three. And they account for almost, well, probably not over 90% of the total. 
you get down to number four, that's me. I'm at five to seven percent. So most of the information you're getting is not my definition of IPM. It's the definition that emphasizes we have to do preventative approaches that minimize our risk. And that includes neonicotinoid C treatments. That's one of the reasons why we are where we are. Uh, for better or worse, you know, the, this university extension representative or university researcher is not some, somewhere where, where most of you will get your information. So what are the barriers to IPM? Why aren't we doing it more? Well, one of the reasons with these pests that we talk about when we talk about seed treatments is they're under the ground. They're difficult to count. They're difficult to find. The weather is cold and crummy when you would look for them, often in April. They're difficult to monitor and track. It's not as easy as hanging out a trap, counting the number of bugs on there, and then deciding. So that that's, is a significant barrier. We don't know as much about them as we do about some other pests, although those studies that I showed you earlier, they did track the pests and they found very few of them there, which isn't surprising because if you would agree that um, these neonicotinoids do kill some pests and we've been using them nonstop for about 15 years, there shouldn't be many of them out there. They should be having a very hard time. Uh, by, all, by any indication, there should be far fewer than there ever have been in the past. There's also a fear of having to use other older insecticides to replace neonicotinoids. And you hear this one a lot that, oh, we'll have to go back to pyrethroids and all these old nasty chemicals that are harmful for humans and so on. That's not true necessarily if you don't have any pests there. You don't need to use any insecticide if your pest densities are very low. And that's what I've been saying for years. We can't find pests out there. We can't find yield benefits because the pests aren't present um, in anywhere close to economical numbers. So what I've advocated for is that since we know that the yield benefits aren't often present, our pest pressures, we have a hard time documenting. But we know also that neonicotinoid C treatments offer a short window of pest protection. So you have a small window of protection combined with a pest that is uncommon. So you don't have much chance for yield benefit because you have to have both of those things line up for this to pay off. And what I've said is that these are the factors that, complain, that explain are infrequent observations of yield response. It's not that these insecticides are not toxic, they are. It's not that they can't kill pests, they can. It's that the pests, if they were there before, I don't know, but they're not there now. And when we have a short window of pest protection, we just don't have a lot of opportunity to gain those yield benefits. Um, the problem with any insecticide though, is that it's not without cost economically and it's not without some environmental worries. We know this from past history. Uh, we have in the case of neonicotinoids almost universal adoption, high toxicity, high water solubility, that makes them just tough to handle. Makes it difficult to have good environmental stewardship just because of the amount we're using and the frequency that we're using them. So what do we do about it? I mean, it, it's, you know, you don't want to just point out problems all the time. Um, What's the common ground? I think all of us would like to safeguard the food supply. All of us would like a quality environment. Those are universal goals. One solution that I've advocated for that is, that is available is just reduce the proportion of seeds treated with insecticides. Offering those elite hybrids and varieties with and without, I think a lot of people will figure out if it works for them relatively quickly. You could plant side-by-side -side trials. You could plant a uh, a field, you know, whatever, a 50 acre field with and without, uh, split the planter, for example, it would rapidly be documented where pests were and where they weren't. I don't think it would be an apocalyptic scenario because we have been looking and digging uh, for years and we just can't find economic population of pests. I'm not saying they're not out there, but I'm saying that to find them, we need to do these kinds of experiments. We need to have not just for me, but for all of you, the resources to ask these questions. If you're curious and you want to know, you should be able to do this. But it's very difficult to get the seed. You are told it's not available. I'm told that. And many growers that talk to me are told that as well. So that would let us 
consider field histories, consider pest pressures, and document that, and also tailor the pest management to the situation. Saving money is also something uh, we all like to do, uh, especially with bad commodity prices. And, you know, in recent years, it definitely makes that a little more appealing. Uh, but I think those are solutions that we can that we can reach, but the demand has to be there. I think the demand from producers has to be there. I think for me to say it uh, isn't as effective isn't as effective as if a producer asks for it. So we'll see if we can move the needle on that. It's been a, it's been a struggle, but um, I'm I'm optimistic and I'm always in favor of more data. And the way we get more data is more people asking questions and more people having available having access to uh, treated and untreated seed. That's all I have. I would be happy to take questions now uh, from anybody, either in the chat or, uh, or just in the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Let me unshare my screen here. Yes, you said the uh, effects of the neonectides were showing up two months later wouldn't that coincide with maybe some of the pests showing up? Okay, so when you were talking about the effects, you meant um, some of the stuff that I showed in pollen? Uh, maybe, I don't remember exactly. I was okay. thinking you were showing it. Yeah, showing so... Through other so species I saw, of plants and... Right. So th there were two things I showed uh, on, on the time scale. One of them was got into the groundwater and into the tile drainage in uh, uh, June or July. And the other was that we got some right. positive detections in pollen that we collected in bean from bees. And so I think your question is, since I saw it later, wouldn't that imply that maybe I get pest management later, right? Is that Correct. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that where I'm finding it in groundwater and in pollen of weeds is not where I want it, which is in the crop plant, in the corn or in the soybean. So I want, a lot, I want it on or near the crop to protect the crop. If we've got a bunch of clover that's really showing up positive for a lot of insecticide, that's not very useful. And that's, that's kind of what those data showed is that the, the material moves off site and it may or may not harm bees, but it's not helping, it's not benefiting the crop in that case okay. because it's moving, moving away. Okay, I thought maybe it was still showing up in the crop at that point too. No, it doesn't. Th thank you for the question. It's a good, good clarification. Uh, I've got a question here in the chat from Amanda Baird. Have you done any research studies on treated seeds for pumpkins or squash? There are a great deal of treated and non-treated seeds on the market. I haven't. Um, there has been some done at Purdue uh, and that was done by Rick Foster. Um, and I can't recall the, the results from it offhand, but one of the things that um, we know that's different in pumpkin and squash from corn and soybeans is that you have um, striped cucumber beetle in those crops that vectors a, uh, uh, a disease, a wilt. And so you have to be very aggressive in protecting those plants when they're very young. And it, in, what I'm saying is in those cases, that seed treatment is more necessary. Those plants are a lot less durable than corn and soybeans and you have a lot less tolerance for that beetle feeding because they're vectoring a disease. So you're not so much after the beetle you're after the, you want them to not vector that disease into the plant. So I don't have any of those data. That I, can't, I can't quote any of the numbers to you, unfortunately. But I know we've done that at Purdue. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Stephanie, I think uh, that's it for me. Uh, if anybody has questions for me later, feel free to look me up on email and uh, send them on over. I'd be happy to 
happy to handle them. All right, thank you very much, Christian. Now we are going to move into our regulatory topic with Mark Kepler. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. On this hot winter day, I thought I would show you a background of a cold day in South Dakota. So uh, uh, that's the, the background that's behind me right now. Hey, um, hey Mark? Yes. Can I check real quick and see if there's a, a Timothy Finster on with us, if he could uh, let me know in the chat or give me a shout out. Uh, he's the only one I'm, I'm missing. So if there's a Timothy Finster with us this evening, uh, if you could just let me know. Thank you. Well, let me get my sharing going on here. So it, uh, it is kind of interesting this evening that um, we're going to follow up with this, this whole topic of the bees that we were, were dealing with here earlier. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do that from that standpoint. And that's our regulatory topic that we're going to cover this time around. And uh, we have a program we, we call it Be Aware. And in the case of Be Aware, we're going to talk about some of the things that bees do and some of the different kind of bees that we have <clears throat> in our our uh, crops around our homes and houses and a variety of different places. So first thing we're going to do is talk about the importance of pollinators, uh, how pesticide applicators can help protect pollinators, and Christian has went through some of these things, how pesticides can be used to control pests with minimal risk to pollinators, uh, and the potential effects of treating crops during the flowering period, and uh, with a lot of good information along that line. First thing I think to understand is that 80% of the crops that we deal with um, of flowering plants require animal pollinators. And when they say animal, that includes insects in that category. On the right hand side, you see a, a hummingbird uh, flying around and it's doing some pollination there. But a lot of the pollination we have requires a variety of insects, maybe bees, maybe butterflies, it, it may be birds. It's just a variety of different things that are available. So, and because this pollination goes on, we get fruit and seed production uh, needed for the uh, animals and the wildlife as well as ourselves. And so this slide mentions things like songbirds and wild turkeys. Then it gets into a couple things that really are not gonna be found here on an Indiana farm, except for that one called deer. Uh, and we see the picture of that deer in this, in this uh, uh, photo here. So we do need to have pollinators around. And I always like to take a look at this breakfast. On the left is your breakfast with bees. On the right is your breakfast without bees or the pollinators we need. First thing is off in the left-hand corner, you will see that there's kind of a granola mix there. And in that granola mix, there's a few things missing. Now, most nut trees do not need to have wildlife to pollinate them. A lot of them are wind pollinated, but some of them are not. So there may be some nuts in that. There may be in that case some raisins or that it might be in there that come from grapes, which would be a pollinated that way also. As we look at the plate, obviously the eggs are something that's not a problem with the chickens. All the fruit we have there, the strawberries, the melons <clears throat> on that plate are things that are pollinated as well as that jam on that toast. Uh, the jam, the fruit in that situation comes from pollination. Up in the right corner, uh, cran apples, apple juice, those types of things are pollinated. And in the one, excuse me, and the one thing that I've always wondered about on this slide is how the milk figures in, it's not in the coffee anymore. And obviously our dairy cows don't need to be pollinated, but the only thing I can think of, and I'll talk about a little bit later, is alfalfa in order to grow it and to get it to grow, to produce the seed, we have to pollinate it to produce the seed. And that's the only thing I can figure why that, that picture is there. So insect is by far the most abundant pollinator we've got. And we just talked about honeybees, and there are a lot more different kind of bees in this world than just honeybees. In fact, honeybees are not even native to the United States. They were brought in here from Europe. So uh, it, 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 long before the honeybees showed up, we had a lot of native bees around that do a pollinating, and there's a lot of native bees around that still pollinate. And in a honeybee, and a bumblebee, as another example, uh, are two bees 
that we refer to as social. They live in a nest, they fly to a nest, and so when they get insecticides or come in contact with insecticides, they can take it back to the nest. Then we have a lot of bees we call solitary. They live by themselves. Those are the bees that do not fiercely defend their nest. Those are the bees that are out there that are uh, going out, pollinating, getting pollen, coming back to their own little home. Uh, they don't live in a great big swarm where they protect their nest and go out and sting people when they come close to them. So that would be a case of something like this blueberry bee we're talking about. We also have pollinators that are butterflies and beetles. We just got done talking about the cucumber beetle. And, and even though the cucumber beetle will spread diseases to cucumbers, it also does the job of pollinating cucumbers too. So you'd love to have cucumber beetles around that don't spread the disease that just do the pollinating. So flies and even wasps. This time of year, we're having a, a variety of wasps. Even those yellow jackets will do some pollination. Even those hornets will do some pollination. A lot of their meals consist of meats, in other words, other insects for the most part, but they do use that. As we get further into the year, those yellow jackets really like to have more sugars in their diet. We're getting to that part in this fall where we'll start seeing those yellow jackets hanging around your pop can because they like that sugar is what they do. So um, when a pollinator is visiting a bloom in search of nectar, uh, in pollen, the protein part, it, he's out foraging, and that's what they're really doing. Now, I, I throw this picture in here because this is a case of a greenhouse tomato crop. In the case of a greenhouse tomato crop, we need to have something in there pollinating, and, and we don't turn honeybees loose in this situation because honeybees will travel out a couple miles. You know, the one slide that Christian had showed honeybees foraging out for a distance. Well, if we turn honeybees loose in this greenhouse, those honeybees will be hitting the top of the greenhouse trying to get out of there and trying to forage. But so what they've turned loose in this greenhouse is a bumblebee. And if you ever watch a bumblebee in your yard while it's feeding on something like a clover, it just concentrates on it. And it comes up to it and, and, it, and it concentrates on it. <clears throat> and as a child, I used to go up behind a bumblebee with a glass mason jar and catch them all the time in a, in a mason jar because they were concentrating on what they were doing. So here's a case of a, of a pollinator that's really important in greenhouse crops and people are buying bumblebees to pollinate the greenhouse crops. So we're finding them in a large number of places. One of the other native bees and that's very quite, very common is the leaf cutter bee. And this again is a solitary bee. It pretty much stays to itself and it don't find it in big nests that swarm. Now, when you do find some leaf cutter bee nest, there'll be a lot of larva in that nest, but it's not a swarming nest with a whole bunch of them that fiercely defend it. And I, I leaf cutter bee comes along and it cuts a notch out of these different things that we're looking at. And, and that is what it has done in, in this situation. I think one of the interesting things is alfalfa. Uh, the mechanism of an alfalfa plant is one of a honeybee comes up to an alfalfa plant and it goes to pollinate that alfalfa, that pollination of that alfalfa, it has a mechanism where it essentially slaps the honeybee in the face and knocks him back. And so these leaf cutter bees are really the better pollinators of alfalfa because they have a mechanism to avoid being slapped in the face by those plants. And so it's really interesting to see. So leaf cutter bees are one of the things we have out here. Here's some examples of what they have where they have nest and lots of times they'll put a block of wood together, drill some holes into it and the leaf cutter bee will go into those holes and put its little nest in there and that's the leaves that we see and in this situation they have pupated and some of the leaf cutter bees have come out of that area and, and so these are just another example of an insect that we have that does a lot of pollinating but you don't think about it from time to time. So really the European honeybee, as I mentioned before, are relied upon to do most of our pollinations from a commercial standpoint. Won't work in that greenhouse, but if I got a field of tomatoes that I wanna get pollinated or fruits that are out there that I wanna have pollinated, we bring in these truckloads of honeybees, drop them off, let them go out and forage, and they go out for a, a large distance, 
and uh, they will do pollination. This happens to be blueberries that are being done in Maine. The blueberries we grow here in Fulton County, the growers also bring in honeybees for those operations. Um, why are they so important for our fruit crops? Well, this is a kind of an example that we're going to look at. When a plant starts to grow, <clears throat> inside of it, it has the embryos. They're really not seeds yet because they have to be pollinated. And in order to be, when they're, once they're pollinated, the seeds start to develop. And then the fruit forms around them. It's called an ovary, an enlarged ovary, and it forms around them. The cucumber in the top picture here we've got, you can tell on the left side of it on the end down there, those embryos were not pollinated and so those seeds did not grow. And so that's why that cucumber is malformed compared to the one down below it. Um, and, and so that's a good example of what happens. And essentially when they get pollinated and the seeds begin to form, the ovary swells up, the fruit swells up, and that's what develops all these different ones. And so there's a list of things that have to be pollinated on the left-hand side there uh, in our, our slide that we have. And I threw in these pictures too. These are some things <clears throat> that did not get pollinated. Uh, strawberries on the left, uh, for some reason there was an issue with them. Uh, maybe somebody sprayed insecticides or who knows what, it's not that case. On the right, if you take a look at a squash or a pumpkin, there are female and there are males structures on them and understand the female structure on them it looks like a little tiny gourd on there and when they get pollinated that little tiny gourd then swells up with the seeds around it and and then you have your pumpkins and your squash or little tiny squash whatever it might be in this situation this one didn't get pollinated and because it didn't pollinate it it dries up and falls off we get a lot of questions in extension of why are my blooms falling off well, sometimes they're male blooms and they'll fall off because they don't, they're not, they're contributing to pollen, but they're not the female part. Other times, maybe the males are, are not there and because they're not there, uh, they're not pollinating the females and we lose those blooms. The tomato down below, again, the seeds are not swelling and so the tomatoes have an issue and the watermelon on the right is the same way too. Seeds are not swelling up and so it's having an issue with that plant. So a uh, current state of pollinators that we're taking a look at right now, uh, in the United States, it varies from time to time. Sometimes we lose in a winter time around 40% of our, our bee colonies are lost. And I said winter time, lots of them are lost over winter, but you know, and what, what Christian was talking about earlier, some of those could be lost during the summertime because of insecticides that have gotten into them and carried back to them to that point. And there's a whole lot of problems with the honeybees that they're having out there. Um, one of them is lack of flowers. If you think about it this time of year, uh, we there might be certain types of flowers that are dropping off in numbers uh, and they're just not out there to, to get their nutrition from. Other types of flowers that we have in our garden are coming on. Some of our annuals are staying there and they're to be able to get that. But uh, one of the things we'll be seeing here before too long is maybe some of the golden rods and some of those type of things coming out and we'll see a lot of food production getting put into this fall in those types of things. The pesticides are also there. Viruses and down below is uh, uh, nosema, which are pathogens or diseases that come into them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these mites on the right hand side and of course uh, pesticides getting into the hives are also an issue that we can run into with these different ones. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems we've got with our honeybees is something called the varroa mite. So about 35 years ago, this insect came into the United States or probably longer ago, but I ran into it about 35 years ago. The varroa mite is a fairly large mite and it gets on the back of, of a honeybee and it feeds on the honeybee. Um, so it's fairly small and it also can get inside of the brood itself and feed on the small larvae that are inside of there too. So that's a varroa mite and it can cause some very uh, devastating things to a, to a colony. Then there's another mite called a trachea mite. And just imagine that this, this bug, it's not an insect because it's a mite, this bug can get into the windpipe 
of a honeybee. That's how small these are. And there's lots of mites in this world that are small and microscopic, and you can hardly see them, but that's what this one is. And so it can get into that mite of that, uh, can get that mite into the trachea of a honeybee, and it can cause a tremendous amount of death in that hive. So between varroa mites and trachea mites, there's been a lot of death going in hives. And we've seen that over the years, and there's been a lot of methods that's trying to be uh, created to treat them, even insecticides. And it's hard to think about that, but there are certain insecticides that you can place in the hive that will kill the mites, but will not kill the honeybees. And so that's been used over some time too. So this slide set has a bunch of different questions in it. And the uh, <clears throat> question is, why is it important to protect pollinators? And uh, humans are highly dependent on pollinators for crops. Many plants need pollinators, and pollinators are important for wildlife, and we covered all that. Another question is, which of the following foods depend on animal pollination? Apples, blueberries, cucumber, wheat. All right, we didn't talk about the grains of this world, and wheat is the answer that you don't want here. The apples, blueberries, and cucumbers need to have it, but the wheats, the corns, the grain crops, for the most part, they do not need to have pollination by insects. They are pollinated by wind, is what really ends up going on with them. <clears throat> In addition to honeybees, what other animals can pollinate flowers? Well, a butterfly can, a bird can, a bat can, a fly. I don't think cows do a very good job of doing that. Uh, at least my cows have never done a, done a good job of pollinating that I ever knew of. What are, the, <coughs> what are the factors affecting pollinator health? Well, I already mentioned the mites and the parasites. Uh, nutrition and forages are an issue out there. We've got the right things to feed them and pesticides as Christian talked about. So it's a combination of all those different things that's really caused us some issues. And pesticide applicators can help by reducing risk to honeybees and other pollinators. Uh, if you understand how pesticides can harm, harm the bees, um, let me go backwards. If you recognize the pollinator foraging habits, and we've talked about that, how far out they can go, if you read the label and on the label, and we'll get to this a little bit more, will be a label, a box on there that talks about how this, this bees are affected. It's a bee box, I call it, on there, and it'll refer to bees on that. If we use uh, integrated pest management, we just had a lesson in integrated pest management, and if we do follow our best management practices. So that's how we can do those things. Now, did you know that there a lot of pesticides are not toxic to honeybees and other pollinators. Now, here's the terminology. Remember when we talk about a pesticide, pesticides are fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides, rodenticides, and avicides, a whole bunch of different things besides insecticides. So when we're out there spraying, <clears throat> we may not be dealing with something that's toxic. So look at the guy on the right, he's doing an orchard spray. If he has a fungicide out there trying to control uh, apple scab in his orchard, then he is not gonna be harming the honeybees that might be out there pollinating. But during pollination time, that man is not gonna wanna be out there spraying insecticides. Oh, it's important to pollinate them. We turn honeybees loose in an orchard and it's important to get them pollinated. And so we don't wanna be spraying insecticides at a time when we're trying to pollinate things. And that's why it's not in that form. So insecticides then are more toxic to pollinators and fungicides and herbicides. Uh, but not all insecticides fall into that category. Remember I told you there was an insecticide they put into the hive to actually kill the mites. Um, and uh, even though mites aren't insecticide, that is an insecticide because it does kill other insects too. So we can get pollination poisoning from direct exposure. Uh, so that means the, 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 the insect, the, the honeybee is out there the, and is actually feeding on the plant and we're coming along and spraying it as if my apple orchard was in bloom. That's a perfect example. Uh, residues picked up through foraging. <clears throat> so we, we have, we sprayed, it's drifted over into the fence row somewhere and, it, and it's on that residue 
on those different plants. And that's the other one that I want to mention. It could have drifted over there and came into contact with it. Some pesticides remain toxic to bees for some time after the application is made. So some of our insecticides uh, will stay into the plant. Now Christian did a good job of talking about how some of the insecticides go up into, up into our corn and our soybean plants, and they're great ones to have uh, into that. And so we don't really have insect pollination of corn plants, and the soybean is blooming is later on. So we don't really have the, the residual problem in that situation. But we can have residual toxicities where I think a good one to look at is some of our plants that we have in our, around our, uh, our landscape where we have maybe applied an insecticide to kill one bug, but that insecticide remains around, and gets into the flowers eventually. And I'll give you a good example. We were talking about the neonicotinoids. The neonics are what we use as far as grub control in our yard. And so if we make an application to our grass for grub control, the neonicotides are applied to the grass. They can be absorbed and brought up through the, the, the Dutch clover that I have growing out there. And when that honeybee comes to the clover and feeds on that clover, then it's going to get into the bloom, and then it can also get neonicotoids. So that's a residual toxicity that we're, we're getting into. Some of these products then have that extended period of residual toxicity, and uh, those are things we don't want to be putting on or applied to blooming crops or weeds. And so um, there are some pesticide families that form in that category. The organophosphates, which are the, uh, the old line that we've had around, like malathion, uh, chloropyphrus, uh, dursban, those type of things. The carbamates, the car car carbaryl, which is seven, the insecticide. I just mentioned imatocloprid is one of the nicotinoids, and some of the pyrethroids, and there's a, lots of pyrethroids are out there. So there will be a spot on the label that talks about those different ones. So the neonics, uh, again, uh, uh, just some of those names that were went over is uh, when you look on the label and we talk about thiomexican, thiomethyl X, uh, Christian will do it better than I. That's the neonicotide, that's Cruiser. Poncho is listed here. Grub X um, changes every time I blink my eyes. That's the grub control that's in the lawn. They put different products in it. Sometimes it's had imatocloprid, and these other ones are also ones that have been into that. And I just mentioned about grub control. And so that is a way to spread insecticides in our home area that can cause some issues with it. So um, one of the interesting things about honeybees that you got to worry about is when the sun comes up, they are out foraging and they are out foraging all day long. And the honeybee foraging then drops off or as we get closer to sundown drastically as it goes back to the nest. Um, unless it's cold or unless it's raining, this is the normal foraging curve of honeybees during that time period. Uh, so if we're doing an insecticide application, one of the things we might want to do is not do it during the time of day. The other thing is on some of our plants, the, the flowers, and I'll give a good example, that would be like a, uh, a melon plant. The flowers will close up in the evening, and when they do that closing up, you're not getting the insecticide right on the inside of the flower. So maybe our best time is right at sundown to be applying pesticides. Uh, to our crops to reduce the application problems go along with it. Uh, when crops or ground covers are in bloom, consider using pesticides that have a short activity period. They only last a short period of time. And uh, again, late evening would be our best time. Uh, don't put them on when they're in full bloom. We've talked about that. So on the label is going to be uh, a pollinator protection statements. They're going to be right there on that label for you to take a look at. Um, and, a, and so we need to check what that says on that. And so what the idea behind this is to try to cut down our exposure to these different pollinators that are on the label. And, and you need to look at the label ahead of time. It's hard to do it the day you're going to go out there and spray right now. That's not the time. Night before, when you're going out the next day, you're settling down, maybe that's the time to take a look at it. And so this is the box that we talked about that's on that label. It's the bee advisory box. And it, and it is 
it's usually this kind of a color a scheme associated with it and it has a lot of things at first at the top it talks about the application restrictions uh, what different things you got to look at it talks about the bee icon helps signal the pesticides potential to bees so that'll be on there um, it, it talks about bees or uh, when they're out there it'll give a lot of different information that you want to look at on there how to minimize your drift some things you might want to do to, to try to prevent drift from happening. Um, and, and so that B box is on your pesticides and, and take a look at it. And this has come into effect in the last few years. So these pollinator protection statements should inform you of the pesticide and application timings and help you make your decisions. And if you take the time and, and read that B warning that's on the label, you're gonna get that opportunity to help protect those different bees that are out there and other pollinators that we're looking at in those different labels. So Indiana also has a pollinator protection plan. Uh, growers and applicators should know if they're pollinators near our pesticide application sites. And, and um, we also like to identify nearby beekeepers if we know that so they can do something about their hives so they can shut them down for a day if we're doing some kind of spraying and we try to get our best management practices out there to help us uh, work with our our pollinators and so um, just a different topic altogether that i don't have on this slide set is we have this whole group of um, ways that we can get into to try to to, to register our, our, um, our uh, hives and uh, we can get into that and I'll get into that just a little bit later on, the different ways that we can let people know that we're out there and it's, we need to look into these. So our questions, do we know the growth cycle of the crop? Now I'll go back to the easy one, I'll go back to the, to the uh, apples that we were talking about earlier. Obviously, when it's in full bloom, I don't want to be spraying insecticides. That's part of the growth cycle. The same thing comes on when we're talking about um, um, some of the other, if we're talking about wheat, we're not dealing, or corn, we're not dealing with potential pollinators in those situations. Um, and so we have a lot more leeway with it. We still have Lepidoptera. We still have things out there that feed on them that they potentially could be but we need to know when they'll be in bloom. And soybeans are an example of a crop that obviously if it's in bloom, we're spraying insecticides, the honeybees are around, the bees are around, and they will feed on those blooms. Uh, we need to know when the predicted dates that pest will need to be treated. We, what else is blooming nearby? There's a lot of things out there that could be blooming that we could have drift going over to into the the ditches and we took a look at that great slide that christian had that talked about how that those those products get up into the air and drift for a long ways over into those other things blooming nearby cover crops is something else that falls into play if uh if they're blooming if there's weeds uh, boy i was out spraying fence row just here this past week and one of the things coming up in my fence row was ironweed big purple weed man it had butterflies and bees all over it so those things that were blooming at that time if my neighbor has certain crops and orchards that might have honeybees out there and what other pollinators might be in that area so um and one of the things we got to look at is, can we take these blooms off by mowing? Uh, so if we got a lot of blooming things in the ditch, maybe just mowing those off in that ditch area before we spray things on or reduce the potential toxicity to those different bees. The integrated pest management plan uh, goes beyond just chemical control. It looks at it, and I'll go back to that one chart that Christian had uh, where he was taking a look at uh, does it pay off with with $8 beans and, and the fact was it broke even. And so if, it, if it's just gonna break even, we're putting chemical out there needlessly into the environment and that's gonna come back to bite us sooner or later and it already starting to, but it's really gonna come back and we need to be taking a look at integrated pest management as much as possible. So use pesticides only when needed. I listed soybean aphids here. Uh, soybean aphids have not been an issue for a couple years. 
But when we go out and we have a really tough year of soybean aphids, do we walk out there and look at those soybean plants? And if they got aphids, we spray them right away? No, we wait it off until the the aphid numbers are large enough that it's causing an issue. Because once I go out there with the chemicals and kill off those aphids, there are tremendous number of foraging good bugs out there, uh, bugs that are feeding upon the aphids, even like um, uh, a wide number of different insects that feed on aphids. When we spray that pesticide out there, we kill all those aphids off. And so because of that, once we spray that, the aphids are killed. There's a small amount of residual aphids out there that'll come on. And when they come on, there's gonna be no other insects out there to eat on them. And so the population will just explode. So depending on what time of year you spray for aphids, you may be spraying it two times or three times. So once you've pulled the trigger on the, on the chemical application for those things, then you may have actually have to do it several more times than we have the aphids. So it, it's always good to wait. Maybe we can get a good rainstorm. Maybe we can get a good uh, wind that comes along with a rain that drops down our numbers of aphids that are out there and, and try to wait till we get to those thresholds. And, and so let's, let's hold off as much as possible. The other part, of course, that's all done through scouting. And if we go out there and scout and look at our different numbers, uh, we, we want to look at that. And don't be spraying pesticides when it's blowing, wind is really blowing. The labels will have numbers on it as far as those can go. So this is what I was talking about was the beekeepers, locating the beekeepers in your area. There's a program called Drift Watch. Uh, Drift Watch is not a government-run registry but it is also done through the state chemist office. So how do I put this? The state chemist office works with this. So you can go to this registry called Drift Watch. If I have a beehive, I can go into Drift Watch and I can register my beehive on there through Bee Check. Um, and uh, the use terms here, Drift Watch, Bee Check, Field Watch, uh, field watch is the overall category, and within fee, field watch, there's bee check and drift watch. In other words, if I want to register my hive that's there, I can do that, and it'll tell you on the label to go to this certain site, and we have information on how to get to this site, and you can tell where there are honey bee hives in your area and, and people that have got them out there. It also will refer to in this drift watch areas that might be organically grown or special situations that people have. And that's why we have this drift watch. Um, and it's really, it's dropping the onus onto you that you need to go check these sites to make sure that you can find, uh, to find out if there's anything in the area. It, it's not a case of, well, I didn't know well, yeah, there's a way to find out, and all you got to do is make a few clicks on a on a computer, and you can get into that site and do that. So, what has the EPA recently changed with regards to pesticide labels that will help protect pollinators? Well, they have that on there. They have this pollinator protection language, and they have this bee hazard icon. You saw that's on there. Lots of times, the color will be that nice orange color too. Doesn't have to be, but it'll be on there and we can see that on there. But it will have this bee statement on those labels. What does it mean to have foraging bees on an intended application site? Well, you sure ain't gonna apply the pesticide whenever you like. Uh, you, uh, you can apply a non-ERT, that's the extended release pesticide, from dust until dawn, so you can get by with that. It doesn't mean you have to quit applying pesticides altogether. What are pollinator poisons most likely to occur? Well, uh, the answer to that is, whoops, when pesticides are applied to crops during the bloom period, absolutely no doubt about it. Um, when you're sprayed from the air, it increases. When pesticides are used, it obviously increases, but most likely is during that bloom period. All right, the next one, what additional information might be useful to you when deciding what, where, and when to spray? All right, information that might be useful to you during that time period. All of these things, the location of the field, is it close to somebody else's operation? Uh, what's going on around it? What's flowering around that field and downwind from the target? What could be drifting down to it? And are there any sensitive areas around there? Downwind again from that field. So we might wanna know what the wind is and the wind speeds are going on. Those are things we all know that we have to look at on a label and those are questions that you need to answer for yourself. 
So this is some of the information for this B uh, project that we're taking a look at. And so I have want to stop here and take a few questions. And then I do have another slide set that uh, we need to cover tonight that I will go through with that. So I'm gonna stop sharing that slide set and ask me a few questions if you've got them up there. And I think I saw Christian was still on. Uh, and so maybe you can ask both of us. He'd be a whole lot better than me on these things. Okay. If we don't have those questions, I'll go on to the next thing that comes on. And I, I was asked tonight, because we have been doing a lot of different programming with um, cover crops, and how when we're dealing with cover crops, and we mentioned it in the last slide set, that we have cover crops out there that can cause some issues, how we can deal with cover crops and our weeds and I bring this one up because a lot of us are putting in cover crops. We're seeing a lot of individuals doing that. We've had cover crop field days. We have a lot of these that have been put in to help help our soils out. But there's some things you got to worry about, some things you got to watch in these cover crops. And so with that, let me go into this slide presentation that talks about our, our different cover crops. And uh, uh, let me get it here, slide set. Uh, from beginning. There we go. So um, first off, the Indiana State chemist is the one that put this together. We're all pretty familiar because we have a pesticide license. And we know what the Indiana State chemist is as far as pesticides go. But one of the other parts of the, the job of the Indiana State chemist is there's a division of seeds. They talk about the seed commissioner. And Don Robison is the one who's put this slide set to begin together. He is a seed administrator with the Office of Indiana State Chemist. And so just like uh, in the other part of the Indiana State Chemist that I'm familiar with is the feed end of things. Feeds and seeds and, and pesticides all have different labels on them. And those labels tell you a lot of information. And with the cover crops and, and, and I'll one time, and I'll get back with you. All right, bye. And with those different cover crops that we're dealing with, they have to have a seed label on it. And let's get into that seed level. They may or not, may not, depending on what we're talking about. We'll get into it. So cover crops. Is cover crop seed subject to the regulations by the state chemist office? And the answer to that is yes, sort of. And I'll get to that sort of pride as we go along here, what kind of regulations they get involved with it. So the first one of those is, the are exceptions from their labeling requirements. So the state chemist, if you're selling seed, if I get seed purchased or I go to purchase any kind of seed, there is a lot of information on that label, like germination, weed seeds, um, um, those types of things are on that label. Uh, yeah, germination and weed seeds are the two biggest that we find upon those different things. And so I have to, if you're going to a, the, uh, somebody and buy a label, we uh, are buying labeled seeds off of them. They have to have that label on there. So what doesn't have to have a seed? Well, if I'm in growing grain for seeding and sowing purposes, so the growing not for seeding and sowing purposes. In other words, my livestock are going to eat this. So I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to have a seed label on my corn or my uh, wheat or oats or anything like that if I'm feeding it to livestock. So seed that satisfies all the following. If I've got seed that's grown on, on the property owned by the seller of the seed, the common thing that we see is I may grow my own rye. And if I grow and harvest my own rye, keep back that seed and replant that seed, I don't have to have a label on it, okay? Seed that is sold and delivered to the purchaser on the property in which the seed is grown. So I have this rye that I grew that I'm using myself, but my neighbor Frank, comes over and Frank comes over and buys some rye seed from me, okay? And he can do that. Can I take that rye seed to rye, or that rye seed to Frank? No, now I'm outside of that law then. He has to come to my property and purchase from me. And also seed does not contain weed seeds classified as noxious 
or exceed the maximum of 2.5% of all weed seeds. There is a list of plants, Canada thistle is a good example of one, that are noxious weeds that in the state of Indiana. And, uh, and so if our weed seed comes into that, if, if we have some weeds in there that are noxious, we sure shouldn't be selling those seeds. There's always been known as a farmer's exemption. And so here I am, I told you that I have got rye, but if I advertise my rye, now you think of advertising, you think of putting it in the paper or putting it on the internet, but it could also mean I put a sign out in my yard that says rye, $15. I'm advertising that. I am no longer exempt from that seed. If I have rye on my place, Frank knows I've got rye, Frank comes over and says, I wanna buy some rye off of you, that's fine. If I put a sign out in my yard, rye for sale, $15, then I went beyond the farmer's exemption. And then we'll talk about what that means. If I'm also selling it for higher than current market prices, and if I'm also selling seed that I did not produce, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a seed salesman then. And so that is not a farmer's, I may be a farmer, but I'm a seed salesman at that point, And that's not exempt. So weeds, weeds are what we find in these cover crops. And it's one of the issues that we're finding in a lot of different cover crops. The vast majority of our cover crop seed in Indiana is clean and has a good germination label level. The one that has an issue more than anyone else is rye. And we use a lot of rye for cover crops. And a lot of the issues are due to this locally grown seed that's not managed as a seed crop. It's just grown out here. We combine it like we combine our rye and then we turn around and seed it. And so um, those are the ones we're really looking at. Most of our rye seed that goes through professionally grown, that gets labeled, that the label gets sent to the state chemist, and I'll talk about how that's done, uh, are, don't have as big an issue. But it's these locally grown rye that we can have some issues with in its weed seeds, and it's also germination potential, and I'll get into that as we go along here. Uh, so rye is an example. One sample they had had a 95% germination. Okay, that sounds good, but it was only 93% pure. In other words, it had 6.41% something other than weed or other than rye. So generally those were some noxious weeds and 21 other weed species. So we can pick up a lot of weeds potentially from our rye. And, and so the state chemist has something they call official samples. That's one they do, their people go out. They have a systematic method that they get those samples. So many bags, uh, so many lots out of different lots. It's statistically significant. In other words, they use stats. That it's, it's, it's there. Uh, they have different sampling sides, and that's their official sample. Service samples, something that you send in or a seed company might send in, uh, and it may not be significantly statistics because there's no methodology to the sample. So I'll, I can send a sample in and see what it looks like. So some of the official samples that they've seen, so they've went out and checked these things out. In 2018, they had official samples that had a 32% failure rate of rye. Uh, mostly were due to low germinations and some of them were due to weed seeds, but they've got a chart here that looks like you know, the germination just varies across the different years. And it not only varies across the different years, but it varies across the locations in Indiana too. So in 2016, the average germination of the rye was 83, 2017, 76, 2018, 79. So none of them are really great germination rates uh, in the samples they take. So there is issues with rye. And I always think back um, when I know somebody that got some oats one time, went and bought some Ben Run oats, took Ben Run's oats, sewed them into a seed field, and uh, actually got them for an elevator. Um, so he bought them as seed oats, not eat seed oats, but as feed oats. And he never had any oats come up whatsoever. It was zeroed out that year. Just not, I looked at that field and there was nothing out there. So um, that's the germination. So out of 112 samples in 2017, Southern Indiana at that time had 75% germ. Northern Indiana had 82%. Those sold by professional seedsmen had 90% germs. And so when you pay a little extra, and if you're paying a little extra for the rye that's grown by, that has gone through the official process, um, it, it may have been 
a whole lot better deal. 23% of all the local rye was below 50% germination. I think you can afford to buy certified seed in that situation. Um, is it always the best? Well, um, no, but it's normally a whole lot better. And it normally, when we take a look at these different things, we do have some weed seeds involved in them and some of the samples can have some weed seeds there. So these are a couple of different seeds that were issues back in 16, it was corn cockle, 17 was quack grass, 18 was garlic, curly dock, and the amaranth, which pigweed combination is what that really gets into. Palmer amaranth probably is what they're looking at. Uh, just the other day, I got a call from a farmer who had rye. And he said his rye was full of weed seed. And he had harvested it, and it turned out this weed was called corn cockle. Now, a lot of people are not familiar with corn cockle. That list I just showed you, one of the ones they had they were talking about was corn cockle back three years ago. Well, so this is a winter annual. It germinates in the fall, grows in the spring, comes to seed about the same time that the rye is harvested, and this is what it looked like. This was a, uh, what that plant can look like. Uh, it is then harvested, and these are the seeds that was in there, and he told me that about 10% of that rye, 10% of that was in there, was this corn cockle seed. Uh, so here you go. If we're going to take that rye, and he would be would take it back out and reseed it for a cover crop because he does a lot of cover crops. Uh, I've got 10% corn cockle. That's a tremendous amount. And so we can try to blow it out. We can try to clean it, but there'll still be some in there. And probably the worst thing about this corn cockle to me is you can't even feed it because it is a poisonous weed when we feed it to, to livestock. And it doesn't, from what I've read about it, take very much corn cockle seed to be a poisonous plant in there. I talked to another guy one time that a talking to me about um, he had planted some wheat and he brought this weed in and I had never seen this weed before. This was little barley. I looked it up. I finally found out the answer to it. I said, well, yeah, this is a weed out in Kansas. We said, you know what? That's where I brought my seed from was out in Kansas. That's where it came from. So sometimes when we buy out of state stuff, we bring in some weed seeds from out of state. And that's what he had done in this situation. And now uh, little barley has grown on his farm and it'll probably come to, to head and, and be a weed issue there. So you can get a seed test. And the way you can get a seed test is you can pull a sample. And this is the, this is their methodology that the state chemist likes to see you use uh, to do it. So this is a, a methodology we've got up here. You go get 10% uh, of our, our, our different bags plus five more bags. Um, you, you pull it out of that and you get total seven bags you want to do in this situation. It talks about how to do that. Put them in a quart bag, send them down to the state chemist. Don't wait to the last minute. It takes them three weeks to do this time. So try to give them some time period to, uh, to get it done. Get them at least a month ahead of time to get these different seeds tested. And they will test them for you for a fee. Um, and then they will give you back a report. And here it is, rye. And, is a, and here was a claim 77%. In this case, this seed sample had 80% germination with that rye. It had the crop seeds and it told you what kind of weed seeds were found in there. And some of the noxious ones, there's quack grass that's on there and field pennycrest is another one that was on there. So you get a lot of information back when you send the seed down to the state chemist and you can get that information from them and it is really good to have. Another one and my last thing that I want to talk about is organic seed. Organic seed has a tendency to be ones that have more weeds in them. So uh, organic seed that's professional grown generally looks pretty good and, and so we get those, but those locally grown organic seeds generally have a, just a little bit higher content of noxious weeds and they've seen this for the last couple of years going. Yeah, one sample they had had 14 weed species per sample. It was up from 11 and seven, 16, and this was 17. And some of those organic weeds, small seeds are hard to clean out of there. In some cases, they don't even think it's been cleaned at all. So um, I guess the take home message to this is, there's a lot of thinking to come into play, especially if I'm gonna use rye as a cover crop. Do I want to, first off, I, I, I just know, that uh, 
as we look at some of the numbers there, they only had a half a germination rate in some of those different crops out there. And it'll pay to get a germination test to find out what it might be. If that germination test is really low, then maybe I need to go get some certified seed that has been tested and we can take a look at the germination. And so with that, that is the last of our slide sets that we have on that. And I am open to some different things that anybody might have. And Stephanie, you might want to find out what our questions might be. I am not seeing anything in the chat box, but if anyone has questions and they want to unmute and ask them, they can go ahead. Anybody want to tell me some rye stories or cover crop stories that didn't germinate? Is it cereal rye or anything? Cereal rye. rye, yeah, it's not rye grass, cereal rye. Okay. And that's what that corn cockle was in cereal rye that we were talking about. You know, I had never ran across that weed before, and I find it to be, uh, um, uh, you know, all of a sudden we've got 10% of our seed is that. That's a lot. And and so obviously it was there years before, and it's been allowed to, to, to come on. And so uh, in his situation, I think it's time to maybe look at some certified seed and, and restart our process and maybe saving back from that in the future. Anybody else have any issues out there with rye? Have had and cover crops? Voles. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's a different situation altogether. Uh, anytime that you put out um, um, grasses and covers like that, the voles, which are not moles, but little tiny field mice type thing called voles, can be an issue in those and, and uh, can be very destructive. Uh, depending on what you're doing. I know the local Optimist Club took a pasture field one year, ripped it up, put it out the pumpkins, and the voles wreaked havoc on those pumpkins. Uh, they really ate those pumpkin seeds up. Not a lot of seeds left out there when you get done doing that. Just a few little pumpkin seeds, and that was definitely edible to them. Okay. Well, I think you need to go ahead and take care of business and what your business might be this evening.